everyone welcome back to my channel so a lot of you guys asked me for a renal physiology questions video or like renal questions in general so in this video i'm gonna uh, walk you through renal physiology questions especially those up and down arrow ones so let's get started all right so like i always tell you guys i read the last two lines first so imaging studies performed after the surgery show a partial obstruction of the right ureter and this looks to me like an up and down arrow question with mild dilation the proximal collecting system and he's showing me gfr and filtration fraction so if i were in the exam guys i would do it right away i know that their obstruction the right ureter produces a certain effect and i will choose the choice without finishing the vignette but for our purposes here i'm going to explain to you why i would do this so let's read the question from the start a 48 year old woman is evaluated for postcoital bleeding and vaginal discharge Pelvic exam shows a fibro mass at the cervix, so obviously she has cervical cancer. And so they had to do, because of her metastasis, they had to do radical hysterectomy. So you guys know that there is the ureter and the uterine artery, you know, they're very close together. So there's a very high risk of injuring the ureter during hysterectomy. And when the ureter is injured, the surgeon will obviously repair it but when it's repaired it's gonna be there's gonna be a stricture like the one you see right there and so that's what leads to partial obstruction so urine is gonna back up and it's gonna lead to dilation of the proximal system the collecting system right now how will this affect the glomerular filtration rate and filtration fraction you guys know that in order for filtration to happen, there is uh, one big force that governs this, which is the glomerular hydrostatic pressure. And there is two opposing forces to this filtration, which is the Bowman's capsule hydrostatic pressure and the glomerular oncotic pressure, like the proteins inside the glomerular capillaries that try to bring the fluid back into the capillaries. Those are two opposing forces to filtration. But fortunately, under normal conditions, filtration occurs and the glomerular hydrostatic pressure beats all these other forces. However, when there is partial obstruction and there is pushing back by the uh, buildup urine this is going to increase Bowman's capsule hydrostatic pressure, pushing behind an opposing filtration. Opposing glomerular filtration means that glomerular filtration rate has to decrease. So I've already eliminated answer choices A and B. Now I'm left with C and D. You got to know, guys, that there is an equation which says that filtration fraction equals GFR over renal plasma flow. So if GFR decreases, filtration fraction has to decrease accordingly, right? So the correct answer is D. Now, I just found out, guys, that first aid has a table just like that. And I found that constriction diureter decreases GFR and filtration fraction. So yeah, you should have got it from there, right? Moving on to the next question. Again, I'm going to read the last two lines. Pitting edema is evident in the bilateral lower extremities. This looks to me like, you know, generalized edema could be renal, could be cardiac, could be hepatic, right? So we're going to read from the start. But levels of which of the funk substances will be higher in the pulmonary vein compared to the pulmonary artery and is giving you so many choices. Let's see. A 63-year-old man comes to the office with exertional dyspnea. 
that has been progressing over the last three weeks he sleeps in a recliner with his head elevated guys the fact that he can't sleep flat or fully supine means this is called orthopnea orthopnea exertional dyspnea and edema suggests congestive heart failure because like there is um decreased cardiac output okay so there is uh congestion and backup of blood in the lungs and that's what causes pulmonary edema so when he's sleeping flat this pulmonary edema kind of gets worse so his uh, breathing gets worse that's why he prefers to be in the um like a little bit elevated anyways his past medical history includes gout dyslipidema hypertension he takes drugs for these and obviously his blood pressure is high distended jugular veins are seen in the semi-recumbent position obviously because of congestive heart failure apical heave all of these suggest that this edema is cardiac edema anyways guys now that we know this patient has heart failure heart failure means there's decreased cardiac output almost everywhere in the body including the kidneys right so there is decreased perfusion of the kidneys and what does that do remember guys decreased renal perfusion increases renin release and in the circulation you got a lot of angiotensinogen coming from the liver renin will convert this angiotensinogen to angiotensin 1 and angiotensin 1 goes through the lung vasculature so here i'm at the pulmonary artery and i'm entering the lung and the capillaries there have endothelial ACE, angiotensin converting enzyme. These convert angiotensin 1 to angiotensin 2. So by the time I reach the pulmonary vein, um, I would have already converted a lot of angiotensin 1 into angiotensin 2. And the purpose of all this, by the way, is to maintain cardiac output by increasing blood pressure through vasoconstriction and through water reabsorption. Uh, this is all in an attempt to restore intravascular volume because of low cardiac output. Anyways, what you notice here, guys, is that I went in to the pulmonary artery with angiotensin 1 and I went out like from the pulmonary vein with angiotensin 2. And so in the end, which of the following substances will be higher in the pulmonary vein compared to the pulmonary artery? It's obviously going to be angiotensin 2. All right, moving on to the next question. A 34 year old woman comes to the hospital with a four day history of abdominal cramps, nausea, and watery diarrhea. So she's been having diarrhea, guys, for four days, and that's not cool. Today she developed dizziness on standing. So she had diarrhea, like she's losing so much fluid to the extent that she's now dizzy on standing, right? Because on standing, venous return kind of decreases, so there is a drop in blood pressure if you are already hypovolemic. Her child had similar symptoms recently, which obviously indicates it's and she's been infected from her son or daughter, her child. The patient has no prior medical conditions, takes no medications, blood pressure is 124 while supine, normal while supine, but on standing, it's lower. Whenever you find something like that, it's called postural hypotension. And pulse is 98, it looks to me like there is reflex tachycardia. So obviously this patient is hypovolemic, guys, from the, from the watery diarrhea that she's been having for four days. Examination shows dry mucous membranes. So this again indicates dehydration. Right, the abdomen is soft, non-tender. Let's take a look at the labs. So serum chemistry shows very alarming um, lab value here. Blood urea nitrogen is 50, should not even exceed 20. So that is very high. It's number one. 
I'm gonna tell you why right now. And urine sodium is eight milliequivalents per liter, and this is considered low. Low urine sodium means that sodium is being reabsorbed back into the blood, right? That's why there is only little in urine. And high blood urea nitrogen, blood urea nitrogen, means that urea is being reabsorbed a lot into the blood. So we have reabsorption of urea and we have reabsorption of sodium. Now, which of the, I need you to keep this in mind, okay? Which of the following changes are most likely to be seen in this patient? And he's showing me values of vasopressin, norepinephrine, angiotensin 2, and endothelin. In order to answer this question, you guys need to know what happens when the person is dehydrated and hypovolemic, as in this patient. So because, she's de because she is hypovolemic and there is a drop in the intravascular volume that fills up the vessels, this low blood volume, because of what she's having, will activate the juxtaglomerular apparatus and the renin-angiotensin system and will end up in vasoconstriction by angiotensin 2, so angiotensin 2 is going to go up, and aldosterone is going to go up to reabsorb sodium and water and therefore restore blood pressure and blood volume. Restoring blood volume by sodium and water reabsorption, restoring blood pressure by uh, vasoconstriction by angiotensin 2. And by the way, increasing blood volume also increases blood pressure. So now you know why she has low urine sodium, because all the sodium is being reabsorbed, right? Very nice. Now, on the other hand, she's also dehydrated, which means her osmolality, her serum osmolality is high. And this will activate osmol receptors and will increase ADH. And ADH will go to the collecting tubules and will increase water reabsorption. But remember, it also increases urea reabsorption. That's why she has a lot of blood urea nitrogen. So you should expect that this patient will have high vasopressin, which is ADH. She will have high angiotensin 2. And at the same time, this same juxtaglomerular apparatus also increases endothelin, which is another vasoconstrictor from the endothelium, right? So, yeah, now we got them all, but there is one left, which is norepinephrine. Remember, guys, when cardiac output goes down because of low blood volume or low blood pressure, the sympathetic nervous system will be activated, right, to, uh, for example, causing reflex tachycardia, which she's having, and releasing norepinephrine for vasoconstriction, right, to try to restore blood pressure. So it makes sense that all of these will be increased. We've seen why vasopressin will increase because of the uh, osmolarity, right? We've been the, because of the dehydration, increased osmolarity. This is the trigger. We've seen why angiotensin 2 and endothelin, both of these from the renin angiotensin system because of low blood volume as a trigger. And the trigger for the sympathetic nervous system is low cardiac output, and that's why norepinephrine goes up. And other catecholamines as well, which cause reflex tachycardia. All of these work in concert in an attempt to restore blood pressure because of her low blood volume. And because this low blood pressure is like means that uh, perfusion is being compromised. So all these act to increase blood pressure back to normal and therefore better perfusion. So it's not really that bad, right? All right, guys. So I hope this video helps. Let me know what you think in the comments. All the best, guys.